everybody was living in what we'd call poverty at that time. A mattress just fit across, and so we three girls slept there. And in the other part, why there's a sofa, but it was one with the back that made it a cot that Dwight slept on. And then had a cook stove and a table. I don't think we ever all sat, sat down around it. I don't remember how we did eat. Snow and then the drought. One followed the other, and it was about more than you could take. <laughs> Some of the farmers burnt corn in their stove. It was only worth nine cents a bushel. They burnt, burnt it in their stove. For American farmers, the Great Depression was the worst of times. In the midst of one of the country's most severe droughts, entire crops burned up in the fields, and grasshoppers and chinch bugs ate what was left. Farmers who couldn't make a living couldn't make their mortgage payments either. Cash-strapped banks were forced to foreclose. Faced with financial ruin, millions of farm families lost their homes, their way of life. Through it all, an Iowa amateur photographer found hope. And amid the despair, he saw the strength and not the weakness. He saw success and not failure. His lens recorded self-reliance and neighborliness, and the photos speak to the warm relationships. They glow with the warm relationships of farm families that got them through the tough times. Pete Weddick's photos captured the soul of rural America. These are the voices of a bygone era. You remember Garrison Keeler, a prairie home companion today? He said farmers could look reality right in the eye and deny it. And I think we just didn't think about reality, we just did it. Everybody was in the same boat. You know, you never, oh, that poor neighbor there, you never say anything like that. But you were all in the same boat. And farms, nobody had anything. The stock market crash of 1929 was like a double whammy on farmers who had been struggling since the early 1920s. With nearly one-fourth of the population working in agriculture, a farm sector in turmoil thundered its way through the nation's economy. Fueled by terrible unemployment and long food lines, fear spread throughout the entire country. And by the early 1930s, nearly everyone was affected. Everyone realized that it was a time of, of desperation, really a time when individuals were vulnerable and there was not much they could do about that vulnerability except try to survive. In 1933, as part of the New Deal, Franklin D. Roosevelt's administration undertook the most far-reaching land reform and planning program in modern American history. And one of the new agencies was the FSA, the Farm Security Administration. The FSA's goal was to come to the aid of agricultural workers and tenant and family farmers. In his role as an FSA county supervisor, Pete Weddick worked closely with Iowa farm families. His job was to help farmers acquire government loans so they could purchase land rather than rent. His hobby was photography, and Pete would come calling, carrying a briefcase full of financial assistance forms, and he'd leave with a photo or two. Leila Carlo remembers the day Pete took this photo. He always come out with a smile on his face and his camera, and he had some idea of what picture he wanted that day. And it wasn't time when I was gathering eggs. So uh, I had to go down uh, and get them out of the egg case and put them in a kettle and go out and stand in the doorway of the chicken house and come out like I had just been gathering eggs 
and then put them back in the case when we were done, which I guess I thought was fun at the time. Pete had always dreamed of being a farmer, but when tough times shattered his dream, he turned to the next best thing, and that was a job that would not only keep him close to the life he loved, but also allow him to help other farmers stay in the land. And when Pete came to call, he was there to help, and most of the farmers welcomed him, and they were happy to pose for his photos. He left behind families better able to cope and took with him a photographic record of the time. You can see in his pictures with, when a person is looking at the camera that they're enjoying themselves, that, they're, um, that they like the person who's taking the picture. Um, and I think that that really is one of the things that's so striking about his photographs, is that he's not a stranger who's come to town, um, who snaps some photos and then leaves. He really knows these people. Leslie Loveless was first introduced to the work of Pete Weddick in 1999 while moving offices at the University of Iowa's Institute for Rural and Environmental Health. And as she thumbed through the pile of photographs she discovered, Loveless noticed a name and address stamped on the back of the prints. It read, A.M. Weddick, Agricultural Photographs, Mount Pleasant, Iowa. It didn't take her long to track down someone with the name Weddick in Mount Pleasant. And it was Robert Weddick, uh, who was a family doctor in Mount Pleasant, and he turned out to be the son of this photographer, A.M. Weddick. And he also told me over the phone, his father always went by the name Pete, um, that this was a, a name that he had taken on when he moved to Iowa from New Jersey many years ago, and told me that there were many, many, many more negatives down in his basement and that I should really come take a look. What Loveless found was an estimated 50,000 images Pete had taken of rural America from the 1920s to the 1960s. And encouraged by her enthusiasm, the Weddick family decided to donate Pete's photographic legacy, which had sat on basement shelves since his death in 1976, to the Iowa State Historical Society in Iowa City. Later that year, Loveless set out to tell the story of Midwestern farm life during the mid 20th century, as illustrated in Pete's photos. Her work, a Bountiful Harvest was published in 2002. You know, our lives are so different now. You can look at a picture of a little girl and you can see perhaps now walking around, she's an older woman. It's still that same face, but how much has passed? Uh, it just is very intriguing to me. Loveless wasn't the first to realize the value of Pete's photographs. Throughout his FSA career and the years following, the snapshots frequently appeared in local and national publications, including Wallace's Farmer, Farm Journal, Reader's Digest, to name just a few. Pete Weddick was born in 1901 in New Jersey, where early on he hoped to become a farmer. Following his dream, he enrolled at Iowa State College at Ames, Iowa. In 1924, he married classmate Ruth Grimes, and two years later began farming with her father in southeast Iowa. But Pete couldn't have picked a worse time. My father had really wanted to be a farmer. He had um, done research before he went to college. He went to the library to find out how to be a farmer, and I said you should go to Iowa State College, not university in those days, Iowa State College at Ames. So he got off the train in Ames in 1920, or uh, 1918 with $24 in his pocket. So he was really disappointed, I think, when we here we are on the farm and we got wiped out three years in a row. Pete's decision to leave farming in 1935 was difficult, but it was one he had to make in order to support his wife and son. It turned out to be a wise choice, though, both for his family and for the farmers he served. And while some might have resented a college-educated man telling them how to farm, most farmers seemed to sense something in Pete that put them at ease. And they treated him like one of their own and welcomed the FSA assistance he offered. And I recall him saying that he had a fellow who was particularly irascible, I think. And I, I can recall this yet because they became fast friends afterwards. And he went out during corn picking time. And in those days, if a man could shook 100 bushels in a day, he was really 
good at it. My father could. And he went out to this fellow, and he was too busy to talk with him. Shucking corn and Dad, Ted said, well, here, let me help you. And boy, they really moved down the line. And this fellow realized, here's a fellow who he may uh, be a city guy, but he knows what he's doing. He's farmed, and he's a pretty good corn picker. Working for the Farm Security Administration allowed Pete to stay near farming, but more importantly for us, it gave him the chance to document a period of struggle and change in middle America. His photographs bring to life the harsh realities and the simple joys of typical Midwestern farm life in the mid-1900s. They illustrate how farm families survived the tough times while maintaining a great degree of dignity and hope and happiness. And many photographers of that time stirred controversy with their pictures. They were accused of being a bunch of sociologists with cameras. But Pete's photos seem to have been taken with a pure desire to document what was taking place and exemplify a lifestyle disappearing. Seeing herself in this Pete Weddick photo reminds Marie Johnson of just how much has disappeared over the past 70 years. Well, it makes you feel a little empty after a while. You know, when you go back and want to see where you lived and there's nothing there. We lived on four different farms when I was growing up. All the houses are gone. I can remember back when people had a family on 40 acres probably had a 20 acres of corn. They had big gardens and stuff. Like, like when my mother went to school up here, they lived on a 40 acres just around the corner there. Or they couldn't have had cash flow of $200 a year. But they raised big families on, on 40 acres. From today's perspective, times might seem to have been simpler then. But simple or not, nothing came easy. Days were filled with back-breaking physical labor, and everyday chores were accomplished without the help of modern conveniences. It was a time when things moved more slowly, a time when roles were more clearly defined, and it was a time when families worked together and they played together. Pete captured it all on film. the simplicity of maybe the routine of every night you know that your parents are going to work in the garden and you're going to, to play. Um, you know that you're going to have your evening meal at 5.30 or 6 o'clock. Um, it's um, very comforting um, and very predictable. My dad never missed a Sunday morning service or midweek, and we was always there early. We started the fires, we lit the lamps, and that's one thing he was pretty strict about, that we go to church and follow the rules as close as we could, you know. The last words my mother said to me, be a good boy. I never forgot that. Pete took this photograph of the Woodruff children not long after their mother died. In already tough times, their father was left to raise six children on his own. And even though relatives and neighbors pitched in, the kids were asked to assume adult responsibilities well beyond their years. And yet even today, you won't hear complaints or self-pity. Like many children then, the Woodruffs did what was needed to help their father on the farm. Well, uh, Dad had a... Uh a very much of a regiment for all of us to go through. And that was from everything on cleaning the house and dusting, to doing the dishes, to doing the chores. And I don't recall too many arguments. It was uh, designated and we did it. You just did. My sister, you know, she did. She got married and then I, I took over. That. That's just, you know, you never growled, you just did. And you had your chores, things had to be done. With no electricity, you know, we didn't have the things that they have today. 
Verena Grant Johnson recalls a day she and her mother served dinner to the neighbors who had come to help build a barn on their farm. Preparing meals was just one of the many chores Verena and her siblings were expected to do. We had to work hard, and uh, I think we instilled that in our children, too. They all know how to work. And I, I don't begrudge it at all because uh, mother and dad were good to us, and but they were strict, and we, we had to work. We had to do our chores, which was good. Beyond the smiles and determined faces, though, Pete's photos reveal a vulnerability rooted in hard times. And what little security families had could be wiped out by an epidemic in the livestock or a complete crop failure. And they knew the depression meant tough times, but then again, tough times were all many had really ever known. I can remember my father telling my mother in the fall of 36, we had $100 to get through the winter and put the crop in. Now, we didn't buy a lot of inputs then. We didn't buy a lot of food, but they made it. You kind of uh, think back and wonder how they managed to have enough vision, enough courage to get through those times. It was tough. It had been tough for a number of years. Many point out they did not realize they were doing without, simply because they had always done without. And even if they had felt a sense of urgency, looking for help from outside the farm was anything but second nature. After all, farms then were by and large self-sufficient. If families could grow their own fruits and vegetables and raise their own meat and plow their own fields, they could come up with homegrown solutions to depression dilemmas too. There was pride in handling one's own affairs. People were so proud, they wouldn't talk about losing land, and they wouldn't talk about foreclosures, and certainly they wouldn't talk about bankruptcy. That was something that people just didn't talk about in those days. Well, my folks didn't talk about their business, but always in the back of the mind, they was afraid they'd lose their farm, because so many people did at that time. But we saved our farm. In 1932, farm families watched prices hit extreme lows, 15 cents a bushel for corn, three cents a pound for hogs, two and a half cents for cattle. And with prices well below the cost of production, most farmers knew that sooner or later, they might lose everything. Some lost the farm. And we had two farms near us that uh, renters would rent. Now, I don't know whether those people were, had originally been landowners, but they were farms you didn't have a chance in a snowstorm of making a living on, and people would come and maybe last one or two years, and then they'd move on somewhere else. Nobody particularly looked down on them. They didn't know but what they'd be in the same situation themselves pretty soon. Nothing was wasted, ever. When a chicken or a hog or a cow was butchered, nearly every ounce was used. Meat from a hog was chopped and ground, odd pieces made into sausage, hams prepared for curing. The carcass also yielded pickled pig's feet and also head cheese and rendered lard. At mealtime, children were taught only to take on their plates what could be eaten. Anything left in the pans and bowls was stored for another meal. In those days, families couldn't afford to turn up their noses at leftovers. In the Depression, you, you knew the value of a dollar. If you had a dollar, boy, you had something. You could buy a couple of meals with a dollar, you know, and you could buy a sack of candy for five or ten cents, and money would buy a lot of things. Wasting water was a sin, too, especially during years of drought. The typical kitchen either had a small pump leading to a cistern, or a water bucket with a dipper was brought to the house for drinking, for cooking, and for washing dishes. And considering the trouble it took to get water to the house, bath time only came around once a week, except in the hot, sticky summer. Early on Saturday nights, before the family went to town to trade, water was heated for the baths and the children went first, 
and then more hot water was added to the same bath water so mother could take her turn. And finally, since father was usually the dirtiest, he bathed last in the same water. We just kind of laugh and we always think of our parents, uh, how gross that had to be for them, you know. <laughs> and the older you got, the worse it would be, you know, because there would be another person in front of you. Um, but, you know, at the time it didn't seem one bit unusual or strange. Sharing bath water would be hard to swallow today, but once a family had experienced drought, water was not taken for granted. And perhaps that's why so many persons raised in the 30s and 40s are still so careful to wonder if the food would last all winter or if the well would keep going all summer. It makes you thrifty. You probably noticed that in people of my age bracket. Uh, they stop and uh, think of every time they let loose of a dime. You know, it's not that they won't spend money, but they uh, they like to get their money's worth and uh, uh, be sure there's a good reason for buying stuff as compared to some of our offspring that figure that money is going to corrode if it la lays around in their billfold over a couple of days. I know in our family, we didn't buy anything without we knew where the money was coming from before we bought it. Tough times taught Depression-era families to stretch the value of clothing, too. A little girl's first dress was likely made out of chicken feed sacks. They were pretty. They were, they were all cotton, and they were so uh, colorful. And you would always try to get at least three and maybe four of the same pattern when you went to town to buy the chicken feed. And uh, you would really look through to find the prettiest pattern. clothes, I can remember this, patched overalls particularly, uh, but you didn't feel that uh, you were out of place because all, you, all your friends wore a few. <laughs> so it was, I guess, good and bad times. Typically, children had one good pair of shoes for school and church, and that would have to last the whole school year. During the summer, they usually went barefoot. Well, I, Mom doesn't like, wouldn't have liked me to stay, but I don't think we wanted to buy shoes in the summertime if you weren't going to wear them very much, you know, because uh, they cost money. And it was fun going barefooted. You could just run outside without finding your shoes, which was nice. Well, uh, we kids went to Sunday school, and I was always glad when we got home you, you went barefooted all week, and then you squeezed those shoes on and just about killed your feet. I was always glad to get home and take those shoes off. <laughs> when Pete first started taking photos, electric lights and indoor plumbing had not yet arrived on most farms. But when electricity finally came, it meant running water could be pumped into farmhouses, and soon plans were in the works for toilets and sinks and bathtubs. Well, it, it just felt like I was uh, the wealthiest person in the world, and the rich, you know, I just felt great uh, not to have to go outside to go to the restroom. Until then, family members had used backyard outhouses for their bathroom duties, tiptoeing, barefoot, in the dark, two yards where chickens ran all day, exposing bare skin on cold winter days, and turning to the Sears Roebuck catalog as a predecessor to Charmin. It was the first time I'd ever been away from home overnight in my life, and I was probably about seven or eight at the time. And we drove into the yard, and uh, the mother came out and said, well, Bob, go on back to the barn. The kids are back at the barn. And at about halfway between the barn and the house, I went by this building that looked to me like an outhouse or privy. It looked like a, gosh, that's a big one. It must be a four-holder, but they had four kids. I could understand that. But <clears throat> so I went on, didn't think too much about it, went out to the bar and played out there. And we came back in the evening and we had supper. And we're playing anagrams. And all of a sudden, I realized I would better go to the bathroom. I went out 
from the dining room table where we're playing the anagrams down the steps outside and sort of made a dash for the four holer opened the door and there were hams hanging in this building it was a smokehouse instead of the privy and i came charging back and i walked into the dining room and the father he said upstairs bob and i went upstairs and they had a flush toilet i couldn't believe it the first one i'd ever seen As he traveled from farm to farm, Pete collected powerful images of survival, and some of defeat as well. And while most of the families he visited were able to continue farming, a few were not so fortunate. Pete could relate to the disappointment these families felt leaving the farm, an understanding that probably enabled him to capture moments that were so intimate and so personal. After the Jorgensen family lost their Nebraska farm, they moved to Iowa with hopes of finding a better life. They got all the way to Kiyosakwa, Iowa before settling for a farm that had no house. To make do, the family attached their trailer to an old chicken coop still standing on the farm. It was home sweet home to them. I never felt like we were poor. I look back now, I think we were in, from today's standards, but in those days I didn't feel poor. I didn't either, of course, like I mentioned to Dorothy earlier, we didn't know the difference. Right. You know, today they've got television, radio. I remembered it being twice as big as what it looks like in the picture. And uh, my dad got a, a well, I guess they call it a gas lamp now, but uh, it was white gas and, and you'd pump, it, pump air into it and, and uh, it would give out twice as much light as a kerosene lamp. And we thought we were uptown then. What few material possessions Pete's clients had back then are long gone today, but they still have the good times, the times they laugh about even today, and they recall the simplest of pleasures. That first year after we got married and everything, I had $90 for my year of work. After I paid the rent and everything, so I, I, I bought a, a, a radio, and all the neighbors come in to oh. hear our radio, and we'd pop corn and, and listen to that radio, and we had a heck of a good time. <laughs> yeah, but I sure remember they used to get together for homemade ice cream. Oh, yeah. yeah. Get two, three neighbors together, and somebody would make ice cream, and then next week somebody else would make the ice cream, and you'd be over there for, for the evening to have ice cream, and they'd done that a lot down in our neighborhood. Almost everyone would go to town on Saturday. They had nothing else to do. This was before television. They would go to town. Some would go to the movies. So there was a movie theater in most communities. And they'd walk around the square and talk. But it was a, a very interesting time. I thought that was the normal way of doing things. Of course, as I grew older, even when I was in high school, that had begun to change. And today, there's not much left of that. On Saturday, uh, we would do our baking, usually on Saturday, and plan what we were going to have for Sunday dinner. Sunday afternoons, we visited a lot with my mother's uh, brothers and sisters' families or my dad's, on my dad's side, go there for the afternoon, or they would come to our place. While Sundays were for church going and socializing, the rest of the week was all about work. They started early, and they were filled with chores. Mothers and fathers must have felt overwhelmed at times with all they needed to accomplish in a day. Well, I think that, that the woman had much to do because, after all, they were the ones that were raising the, the uh, chickens and the eggs and the, and the uh, gardens and all, and uh, canned all of that fruit and vegetables and so forth. So they were busy all the time, as they used to call it one time, the good old days, but uh, there was no electricity at all. So everything had to be done by hand. Well, most of our winter months, I know Dad and I uh, went lots of times. We had a timber about four miles west of here. And I know we'd start out with a team of horses in the morning and walk all the way out to there and then cut timber and come back maybe that evening on there. And I know one morning we went out there, 
we didn't realize till we got home was zero that morning we walked all the way out there. Stress, back then, was having 20 acres of corn to be husked by hand before a blizzard set in, or 20 men to feed two meals a day until the harvesting was done, or six cows that had to be milked every morning and night for 365 days a year. Work on the farm had two purposes, really. One, to feed the family, the other, pay for the land. My grandfather came very close to losing his, and literally the daughters who were teaching school pooled their nickels and dimes to make those payments. So they came very close, but they didn't lose it. And I can remember in the uh, fall of 1947, my grandfather had a closing out sale. He was uh, 71, I guess, then. And he got up on the hay rack after the sale was over and said, uh, for the first time, in a very emotional statement, he was free of debt first time since 1914 when he had bought some land. One thing uh, I can always say is that uh, dad never mortgaged his farm and they never had, uh, never lost that and that's where a lot of people lost their farms altogether and expanded too much and couldn't make it. In 1933, one in every 12 Iowa farms was foreclosed. It would be the 40s before people would see a drastic decline in that number. There was plenty to worry about, but they were grown-up worries. And shielded by protective parents, many who were children then described their lives on the farm as happy, as normal. Leila Carlo certainly has a carefree look on her face as she watches her family's Saturday night checkers game. Well, you know, I don't know if I realize so much uh, of what the Depression really meant. I, I think probably my dad and mother managed things well enough that I don't really uh, have much recollection or feeling of whether we had to uh, try extra hard to get by or not. It seemed like we always had what we needed. But their parents knew better, and they turned to Pete and the Farm Security Administration for help. The FSA's Tenant Purchase Program taught farmers to keep careful records of their farming operation and that was the first step toward greater efficiency. The ultimate goal was to get them in a position where they could buy their land and break the cycle of renting and moving from farm to farm. To help the family budget, Pete would occasionally bring a home economist with him to teach the women better ways to can and preserve food. Jerry Middleschwartz canned over 300 quarts of vegetables every year, so snapshots of her and her husband Jimmy picking tomatoes were easy for Pete to get when he stopped by on FSA business. We were recommended by the, the extension officer as a, a young couple that might be a good, somebody good to have alone. And because we were dependable and we were hard workers and we paid our debts. And we proved it by paying off a loan in seven years, six years of it, I believe it was. Agriculture today only faintly resembles its mid-20th century ancestor. And that's one of the reasons why Pete's photographs are so meaningful. The images depict a family life where husbands and wives work together, or at least nearby, with their children at their side as well. Farm women and their children grew, they gathered, they processed nearly all the family's food. They cultivated, they watered, they weeded, they harvested large gardens, canning the bounty to last the winter months. Canned goods weren't the only things that had to last the winter. Stacks of wood were also needed to warm the cold months. And while the wood stove was used less in the warm weather, gathering wood was still a year-round task often assigned to the children. Cutting wood, and I can remember, I think all of, all three of us had the duty of packing wood for the evening, carry enough heating wood in, and then carry this wood that was split up for the cooking. And uh, I can remember that. That's one of the duties that Small we had to look after every this evening. 
the small tents of wood went on the right and the big ones on the left. I remember that. I don't that. remember that. <laughs> Using a wood stove was the era's version of multitasking. Water for dishes and baths steamed on top, while pies and cakes and bread baked inside. The heat that escaped warmed the entire house. Every day a farm woman would prepare three or more substantial meals, plus morning and mid-afternoon lunches. Family life revolved around food. My grandfather had pie every morning for breakfast. So every morning of his life he had pie. I presume he had coffee, but I don't recall that. Uh, we had, in those days, typical farmer meals, which uh, now that I've had a bypass, it probably wasn't too good for me, but I got through all that all right. But they were generous, and they were at noon, not in the evening. And when, you, when you said dinner, you meant dinner. The fried chicken. The chicken then tastes different when it was right out of your own barnyard there. That was really good. Um, I liked the, uh, when we'd have a pork butchered, I'd really like the bacon and the meat that was cured because that would be hanging on a sawhorse in our north bedroom in one of the houses, I can remember that. And to go up and get that and bring it down and slice it was really good. She made good gravy too, it wasn't lumpy. Back then, the farm family was really a mini food processing industry. Every member helped out when livestock was butchered, processing the meat, rendering the lard for baking and for frying foods. Women and children usually raised the chickens, gathering the eggs, nurturing baby chicks, and dressing the fryer. I do remember uh, the chi chicken butchering. Uh, we would uh, butcher probably maybe even 100 chickens a year and uh, mother would do 25 at a, a time. And my father, uh, you know, it was a family type thing. Uh, my dad would take care of the, the butchering and mother uh, and us girls would help cut up. And that wasn't a very fun job. <laughs> well, I was supposed to go out and get the eggs, but I didn't like that because some of them were selling hens and they would peck at me. So I'd come in and say, I can't get those eggs under that hand. Most of the time, young girls helped their mothers with the housework, with cooking and cleaning and doing laundry. However, if a farm family had only girls, then they would be expected to spend a lot of time helping their fathers with the chores and with field work. I always said I look like my mother, but I'm daddy's girl, and I did follow him. I drove tractor for him, and where my sister had to help milk, I had to help with the fuel work and driving tractor. I went with him for years on the thrashing crew. We had about 10, 12 places we had to thrash, and it was fun. Pete's camera caught Patty Doak playing in a wagon load of her father's soybeans. She was always tagging along when he worked outside. I would take cookies or cake, whatever mother had baked that morning. And then I would take a couple of rounds while he was either planting or cultivating. And uh, I would, we would share the coffee and the treats together. And uh, I, I really thought I was doing something very special for my dad. Bright and early every morning, father, mother, and the kids all took their turns milking the cows. And if dad was busy in the field or mother expecting a baby, someone else would step up and take an extra turn. And then if there was a social event coming, the whole family would work together to get the job done as quickly as possible. And it was a big honor once when my parents went to some meeting and might not get home for supper. And so I milked all seven cows by myself for the first time. Now this is hand milking. I stayed with my aunt and uncle when I was going to high school, and that was part, that was in the deal that I helped with the chores. And we get up every morning and, and milk, 
and he kept 12 to 15 cows and always milked by hand, never did have a milking machine. And uh, actually, I enjoyed it, it didn't bother me, but the coach at school sure didn't like it because I didn't go out for any sports. By the time Pete showed up on the farm, that morning's milk had already been served for breakfast. The cream was separated from the milk. The skim milk was fed to the hogs. And then the cream was taken to town on Saturday night, along with the extra eggs, to be traded for flour and for sugar and for coffee. Basically, we lived on the cream and the eggs. Yeah. Uh, I remember my folks mentioning, we can go to town and spend everything we've got, but we're never broke because we come home and gather the eggs and milk the cows. Milking cows in the summertime was hot, nasty work. The cow's fly swatting tail often smacked faces wet with perspiration, and sweat stung already sore eyes and rolled down the backs of tired legs. But since great care had to be taken to preserve the milk's quality, there was no slowing down because of the heat. We had Holsteins, remember, and they were big. You know, you sit right down in there with a little tight spot. <laughs> I guess. We always accused Dad of doing something else, finding something else to do besides milk. <laughs> he wouldn't come around when we were milking. <laughs> milking cows in the wintertime, though, that was another story. With the winds howling outside and the temperatures falling below zero, the cow barn was an inviting place. Milkers snuggled as close as possible to the warm belly. The heat from the udder thawed frozen fingers, and steam rose from the bucket as it filled with milk. With the coldness of the winter waiting outside, there was no rush to leave the cozy inside. Judging by the hundreds of photos Pete took, harvest must have been one of his favorite times of the year. In July, farmyards bustled with preparation for the threshing run. It was a time of hope, the first harvest of the season. The White brothers still speak with fondness and excitement as they describe the threshing crew and the 20-ton steam engine creeping up the gravel road toward their farm. That's what I remember, it's the sound of the engine coming down the road to coming to our place. and. Uh, it was an exciting time at that time because it was, uh, you lived out there in the country and you didn't see a lot of traffic on the, <laughs> on the road, but uh, you could always tell when the steam engine was coming, the threshing crew was coming, the black smoke coming out of the, the pipe on the steam engine and the sound of the, of the engine. And uh, they, always, they always had a whistle on them, it was yeah, like a, right. a train engine steam train engine to blow that whistle when they got close to your house. <laughs> they knew you were coming. In this photograph, Kenny White rides his pony named Dolly to deliver water to the threshing crew. The water boy was a welcome sight for the hot and thirsty men working in the fields. Of what they called a binder that would cut the grain and put it in uh, bundles, and then after the bundles, they would pick up the bundles and put them in shocks, and those would uh, have to cure or dry out, and then th they had the wagons go out and pitch the bundles on the wagon and then put them into the thrashing machine. Threshing time was especially exciting for young boys whose responsibilities grew with each passing year. Like pencil marks on the wall, harvest time rolls were the measure of approaching manhood. And I imagine maybe by 14, I was allowed to take a team and uh, haul bundles and pitch them into the thrashing machine. That was a uh, big step up the uh, ladder in uh, respect of my peers when I was allowed to do that. Just as the neighboring men came together to make a thrashing run, so did the women team up to prepare and serve the abundant meals. 
I tell you, they had good eats. You know, they had to be at probably 15 then or more. They come in there and eat at one place, and uh, the na one lady neighbor would come over and help the other lady neighbor to feed this gang. They made the, the meat out of mashed potatoes and gravy and a couple of vegetables and bread and butter, of course. And then uh, they also had uh, different kinds of dessert, pie and cake. I don't know, remember what else it was. But the, it kept the women busy all the time. But I look back and think, how, how in the world did they ever work in the afternoon when we ate that much of this? <laughs> well, that was the highlight of the season, I guess. I mean, your neighbors come in, you work together, and you had your stories and your, you know, just general visiting. Neighbors relied on one another. Most were relatives or close friends, but even if people had their differences, they put those aside to get the job done. Without the technology we have on farms today, families needed extra hands and extra muscles. We used to hay together, uh, like the thrashing crew, and then you used to pick corn, probably two or three guys together. Um, that's just the way you did it. It seemed to work pretty good. Uh, everybody couldn't have a corn picker, so one guy picked and, haul, and the other guy hauled, and until uh, the elevator come, you scooped it off, but then the elevator finally come into being, and uh, then they used that. So uh, it was, you know, good neighborhood uh, working together. In those days, we needed the neighbors, and they needed us just as we needed each other in the family. So there was a certain amount of forced cooperation because come a certain time when the weather was bad and you had to get a job done, you needed each other. While the immediate goal of the work was clear, fathers also looked at it as a chance to teach their sons survival skills, passing along the tools of the trade to the next generation. And the instruction didn't stop after dad retired. He would get up early every morning, and even after he moved over to Carroll, he'd come down this road about daylight to see if I was up and go on the farm. <laughs> A few mornings, i hear him coming. I'd jump out of bed and run down and be gassing the tractor up to make him think I was done with the chores. Well, he'd come, and then he would leave. Well, as soon as he left, I'd go in and eat breakfast and do my chores. And, go to the field. It was a time of transition, and the families who went from horses to tractor horsepower witnessed the birth of mechanization on the farm. And while sons were anxious to get on that first tractor, most fathers were reluctant to let go of their dependable team of horses. My father liked horses. He was very good with horses. He continued using horses long after many others had shifted to tractor power. He had arguments uh, why horses were superior. You could grow their feed. You couldn't grow gasoline, but you could grow feed for horses. You could raise your replacement horses. They didn't uh, uh, cause compaction of the soil. My dad never liked to drive a tractor. He thought it was simple when I got mine in 37. and. Uh, I told him, well, you can drive it and see how nice it is. And so he drove it a couple of times around the field. But he says, you got to watch where you're going all the time when you're driving the tractor. The horses, when they come to the end, they'd turn around themselves and go back the other way. So he thought that was much simpler. He never drove a tractor after that at all. A team of horses could do things a tractor couldn't do such as pulling a wagon while the driver was hand-picking corn. The farmer merely had to make a sound with his teeth to move the horses forward, and then yell, whoa, when they were to stop. It was inconvenient to have to stop, get on the tractor, pull it ahead, and then resume picking corn. This one Saturday, he told us uh, if we went out and helped pick, pick all the corn and put in piles, finish picking it, said he'd buy us a dime carton of ice cream. And at that time, a, a dime carton was uh, 
for heaping pint. And uh, so we went out there and really worked hard that Saturday morning and, and got our uh, dime ice cream. It was hard work, but it was always a lot of fun to go with Dad when he was doing the shucking of the corn. And if you didn't do it right, he'd give you one row. He'd take two rows, and if you was slowing down, he'd once in a while that ear of corn would hit you up the side of the head and make you speed up a little. And the horses, they didn't travel very fast, you know. And I knew when we cultivated corn, we cultivated one row at a time, three times. And now the renters, farmers by farm, they don't do any plowing, they just put chemicals on it to kill the weeds. That's all they do. Pete Weddick worked for the Farm Security Administration until 1949, but he continued taking snapshots of Midwestern farm life well into the 1960s. If he were still taking photographs today, his images would portray a lifestyle that continues to change dramatically. The increased mechanization of agriculture has made farmers more independent of each other. As tractors and combines and big round baiters made their way into the fields, old customs were pushed out. Neighbors no longer rely on one another as they once did. Extra hands are no longer needed to get the work done. The technology of power, the technology of equipment, the technology of seeds have utterly transformed the countryside. And it has altered farm neighborhoods as well. Today, for better or worse, rural America has a new face. We were more of a community then. Yeah. Like we had our farm bureau meetings, we had the meetings in the home. No, they don't have, don't, don't have that on. Well, that's, that's what I think we've lost. The big thing we've lost. Is we don't, you don't have that sense of community anymore. You're just out there on your own. Through his work as a roving photographer, Pete Weddick captured the essence of an era that will not come again. His photographs evoke memories, some fond, some grim, of a life that's past. He had a dream to farm, but the Depression wouldn't allow it. His loss, though, turned out to be our gain. And while other farmers harvested crops, Pete harvested photographs, giving future generations enduring images of farm families during the mid-1900s. His gift allows us to hold on to a way of life that's lost. His art helps shed light on who we were and on who we've become. Not all of it was good. It's nice to sit and reminisce about the good old days, but who among us who have lived through that would want to go back to outdoor plumbing, kerosene lights, uh, cars that didn't run in the wintertime and often didn't run in the summertime, that type of thing. I wouldn't want to trade it but except for the interpersonal relationships. I was born in 1930 on a 176-acre farm in Grundy County, Iowa, and I grew up during the Great Depression. And I know about the hard times, but for a farm kid, it was a happy time. We had plenty to eat, and we had all kinds of things to do. We didn't know we were poor. But Pete Weddick's photos have it 100% right. That's the way we looked, and that's the way we were. In 1930, one in every four workers made their living on the farm. Today, it's more like one in every 50. As farms disappear, so do the people living on them. Since we started this documentary, Inez Holt passed away. She was 94 years old. 
And while many of the people in his photographs will continue to share their experiences for years to come, Pete Weddick's images will keep their memories alive forever. I'm Lee Klein. It's been a pleasure to help tell the story.